Sorry. Hi, Paul. We're just starting off now. We've just opened the room. So we... Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Good to have you here. And good to have everyone else here. We're just letting attendees filter in. Um, so we'll wait a couple of seconds. Um, but rest assured, your panelists are here and waiting. I've been asked to fill, fill some air, and I wish I had some data-based jokes ready to uh, to prime the audience, but I don't. Um, but uh, as always, thank you for joining us. And we're at two minutes past the hour. It looks like the numbers are starting to slow down. So I think I will get us started um, and welcome you all to the Ada Lovelace Institute's webinar on rethinking data and rebalancing digital power. My name is Carly Kind and I'm the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, and I'm so pleased to invite you, uh, to welcome you all here today to this really exciting event to launch our new report. Um, some brief housekeeping, if I may, um, you will know by now that there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen and there's also a Q&A box. Please use the Q&A tab for any questions that you have for the panelists and chat is there for you to connect with other attendees of the event. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and attendees video is not visible, just the panelists. Um, there is also uh, captions for those who'd like to use them um, being provided by a live captioner. And again, you can find that at the bottom of your screen. We'd love you to engage in conversation with this um, report and this event uh, online and on social media. We're using the hashtag rethinking data. And I'm really, really pleased now to introduce the speakers for today's event. Um, we have Jenna Sloten, who is the Senior Director of Policy for the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. She's involved in the Data Values Project, which is a global movement to challenge power structures in data, and recently launched a manifesto that calls for change in how we design, collect, fund, manage, and use data. Sushant Kumar is the Director of Responsible Technology at the Omidyar Network. This year, the Omidyar Network has launched the Future of Data Challenge, which invites solutions aimed to reimagine how we think and talk about data, activating a more equitable data economy. Welcome also to Mark Sermon, who's the Executive Director of the Mozilla Foundation. As you will know, Mozilla is a, a, a big player in this field and working to support a movement that develops trustworthy AI. And they have, uh, in the recent years, developed the Data Futures Lab, which focuses on data stewardship. And finally, we're so happy to have Paul Nemitz, Principal Advisor to the European Commission, join us. He is one of the co-chairs of the Rethinking Data Working Group that oversaw this report. And he's been really instrumental in shaping the work of the A. Lovelace Institute over the past few years and really a driving inspiration for lots of the thinking in this uh, in this uh, report. So again, so happy to have you here, Paul. Um, I'm going to invite Valentina Pavel, who was the legal researcher who led lots of the work on this project. Um, but first, I want to just give you a brief explanation of where rethinking data comes from. This uh, almost predates the existence of the Ada Lovelace Institute. One of the motivating ideas behind Ada was this question about how we can construct a system for data use and government governance sorry, that tackles the symmetries of power and data injustice and promotes and enables responsible and trustworthy use of data. And this really translated it into what would become Ada's mission as a research institute to ensure that data and AI works for people and society. So this is a really founda foundational project for us. It has been running since the Institute really got up and running in 2020. And so it's a really momentous moment for us to publish this report, which very much crystallizes so much of the foundational thinking behind the Institute and what we're hoping to achieve. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Valentina to walk you through the report and tell us more about it. Thank you very much. And just allow me one second to set up my presentation. It's going to take a bit of time before it loads, but there we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
just just a, a warm welcome uh, to everybody from my side as well. Uh, this is uh, really a fantastic place to to be in to be able to to share this work with you, which uh, has been uh, on top of my mind for such a long time. And I'm here to take you on a journey, on a journey that began with this big question: uh, What would a more ambitious vision for data use and regulation? look like and what we do we want societies to achieve with data and how can we get there we we all know that today's digital ecosystem is characterized by exploitative data practices that fail to protect individual rights and serve communities political and administrative institutions have a short-sighted view of how to govern data and people feel disempowered because of the lack of agency over data and the profound power imbalances so we recognize the need for a comprehensive and transformative vision for data that can direct our efforts and encourage us to think bigger and move forward. Central to, to the rethinking data work is this question on how can we center governance, regulation, and use of data on the needs of people and society, and how can we contest the increasingly entrenched systems of digital power? To guide our thinking on this question, in 2020, we established a working group uh, with 16 international experts across academia, policy, law, technology, and civil society. And I would like to deeply thank them once again, and especially Katarzyna Similevich for their contributions, their thoughtfulness, and their generosity throughout the project. And together with the working group, we looked at digital ecosystems through the lens of power. Discussions focused on questions such as, uh, where does power reside in the digital ecosystem? Uh, what are the most promising approaches uh, and interventions that might address some of these challenges? And how can we move forward from this place? So through a process of distillation and analysis, we narrowed the landscape to four areas for change. Uh, these are infrastructure, governance, institutions, and public participation. Because in order to address current challenges and achieve transformative change, we need to imagine a new type of uh, infrastructure as the foundational layer that can allow other uh, governance models and institutions to emerge. And we need a new type of infrastructure that can enable competition and meaningful choice for users because there is unprecedented consolidation of power in the hands of a few large technology companies, which reduce the possibility for new alternative services to be introduced. And it, this also contributes to the user's inability to switch services or to make value-based decisions, such as, for example, to determine what type of content is prioritized on our devices. So what we're asking is how can, uh, how can we design new regula regulatory solutions to this problem? And of course, there can, be, can, there can be many solutions. And in the report, we're proposing opening up platforms through interoperability measures as one way to allow more choice of service and to reestablish a competitive market. Each of the main sections in the report start with a short scenario or sort of a, a new vision uh, for the world, imagining alternative um, scenarios. And in this section, we're asking, what if we open up core platform functionalities to be able to plug and play different components? For example, replace the newsfeed with third party algorithms. What type of new dynamics would this new ecosystem create? So secondly, we need new governance models that can help us reclaim control over data and rechannel its use towards societal benefit. So how can we envision a new data governance regime where we open up access to data, machine learning algorithms, and resources from companies to inform public policy and increase accountability? In practice, this can be implemented in many different shapes and forms. And in the report, we're proposing a few provocative concepts. And we're asking, 
what if we require companies to create interfaces for running data queries on issues of, of public interest, such as public health, climate, or pollution? What if we rely on the increased processing and analytics capabilities inside a company instead of asking for access to data uh, to large uh, to large data sets, which might prove difficult and resource intensive for public or authorities or researchers to process. But um, each of each of the sections um, in the report uh, bring um, um, contributions from authors uh, that warn us of more uh, of, of deeper rooted challenges and problems. And in this section, um, our contributing authors warn us of a more fundamental uh, problem, like how, how do we grapple with issues related to who gets to determine how data is made, what it means, and why it is used. And um, here's where new institutions come into play. New institutions that can rebalance the centers of power from large technology corporations towards individuals and collectives, and in order to achieve this, we propose looking into non-commercial institutions to test the practical viability of alternative data governance models, such as data trusts and data cooperatives. And we're asking, what if we create more decentralized models of data governance as a first step towards rebuilding the political economy? If we take a closer look at today's political economy, we see that new data intermediaries currently do not have the political, economic, and infrastructural support they need in order to succeed. So last, we need more effective, inclusive, and res representative policymaking to make sure that the values, experiences, and perspectives of those affected by data-driven technologies are represented and accounted for. In order to achieve this, we propose public participation as an essential component of tech policymaking. And there can be multiple approaches to making participation meaningful from panels or juries of citizens, public dialogues, participatory co-design, or deliberative assemblies. And we're asking, what if members of the public are empowered to create the rules for technologies that impact their lives? What if everybody who wants to participate in decisions about data and its governance is supported to do so? So finally, with this report, we're inviting a, a collective uh, action and aim to inspire a thoughtful debate about transformative change. If you're a civil society organization working on digital policy, we invite you to reflect critically on the goals, strengths, and weaknesses of the proposed concepts. And we uh, invite you to advocate for a more ambitious and proactive agenda. If you're in research and academia, we'd like you to build on the proposals with further research and test solutions. And if you, if you work in policymaking and industry, we invite you to transpose the interventions into policy and practice. And finally, I, I just want to say that this is a, an intellectual journey that needs your participation. By no means, we claim we have all the answers. And in the report, we explored a set of instruments which we believe carry transformative potential, but I hope you'll join us in this effort to further develop ideas and find solutions towards transformative and future visions for data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valentina. And once again, congratulations to you and all of your hard work on this report, which also predated your time at the Ada Lovelace Institute when you were a Mozilla Fellow. I know you were thinking about these issues then as well. Um, so I'm going to turn over to our uh, invited guests and we're going to start with a quick provocation or question for each of them and then and go in a little deeper after that. I would like to hear from each of you what your reflections are on the current state of the, the data ecosystem. How would you describe it? And where would you like us to be? What are what is a big change you'd like to see or what is your your vision a more ambitious vision for digital ecosystems um jenna why don't we start with you jenna is looking very frozen so either is feeling quite pensive about the question or her internet has gone she's joining us 
from a beach in Kenya. So we'll come back to her. Hopefully, Jenna, you can hear me um, and perhaps get on uh, your phone. Um, Sushant, not to put you on the spot because I know you were expecting Jenna to go first, but um, why don't you tell us what you think. So in terms of characterization, the way we see and um, with Omidyar Network, uh, the work specifically that I lead is focused on uh, reimagining or expanding our thinking about data so that we can build a more equitable data future. Within that, the frames uh, of where we are now, we think about uh, three things. One is the concentration of power and profits. And I'll get into the uh, get into the details in a bit. The second is, uh, you know, the public services. There, there are nature of digital services which are closer to being public services, but they are run with misplaced incentives, and that is leading to uh, uh, certain challenges. And third is the dominant narratives themselves as to how we think about, how we talk about, and what are the assumptions and mindsets behind data that feed into our digital economy. So across these three, um, the concentration of power and profits, the public services nature of uh, some of the digital services being run with uh, misplaced incentives and uh, the dominant narratives not supporting uh, public interest, uh, specifically with regards to data. That's that's where we feel we are uh, right now. And within, uh, say, concentration of power and profits, there are various reasons. What we know of for sure are there large US and Chinese tech platforms which are having a dominant impact on uh, the social, cultural, and political landscape. Uh, you could you could argue that the roots of this is uh, roots of these are in surveillance and leading to bigger questions about uh, or rather geopolitical questions about uh, uh, data colonialism. What does sovereignty mean? What does uh, rule making mean in different sort of geographic contexts? And what does extraction mean from a perspective of not just corporations and societies, but also countries and across uh, uh, different geographies? Uh, the second, in terms of public services and the misplaced incentives, the digital systems of today are representing some of the uh, sort of the shortcomings or the yields of our economy at large, which means profit maximization, shareholder primacy, and only focus on one stakeholder is reflective in our digital economy as well. And that leads to the kind of business models that we see. And uh, essentially services which are, which are supposed to be digital public squares are being run with, uh, with not with public interest ethos, but with the ethos of maximization of profits. Uh, the third, in terms of the dominant uh, narratives, there are just a couple of examples that I'll take. Regulation, which uh, is essential and sometimes enabling, is seen as stifling innovation, which I have fundamental problems with, specifically because we've seen highly regulated uh, sectors being very innovative, and especially in the context of our public health crisis. We've seen highly regulated uh, uh, sectors like pharma come up with vaccines. Um, and the second is, you know, the thinking around data as a private resource, as a private property, which can uh, therefore be exploited, monetized, and be used for uh, further extraction of profits. I think this, these two are just examples of some of the dominant narratives, which need to be critically looked at and probably shifted. That's great. Thank you so much, Sushant. I'm going to cut you off there because you've done a great job of describing those three main pillars of the current ecosystem, concentration of power and profits, misplaced incentives and dominant narratives. Mark, can I turn you to the second part of the question, which is where should we be trying to get to? If that, if, if you agree with Sushant's description of the current ecosystem, where would you like us to be? Uh, unmute there. But I, I absolutely agree both with what you said, Sushant, and uh, how the report lays those things out. I will say a, an optimistic version of the ecosystem, because I think all those things about concentration power uh, are, and, and also the inequity and extraction and exclusion that come with that uh, are true. 
I would say that the other thing, uh, you know, on the insider version of the ecosystem with Mozilla as an organization that works on these issues and has for so long is, is the, you know, the current state of play is there is, there's also a growing consensus that those problems exist. Um, it's not necessarily a growing consensus in the stock market or in Silicon Valley, but amongst regulators in many parts of the world, amongst the public, like the, the shift from the tech lash and just frustration of five, six years ago to a sense that something needs to happen through regulation, through demanding different products, even amongst a, a younger cadre of startups and, and entrepreneurs that are trying to do things differently. I think there is another aspect of the state of play of people really hungry and, and in many cases pushing for an alternative. And, and so that's maybe, you know, goes into the, the question about promising avenues for change. Uh, I think where we see broadly people pursuing alternatives and a different vision that, that counter what Sushant and the paper just described is in the places where there is the most harm or the most felt impact. And I think that's the critical thing, going from theory or going from problem analysis to, to solutions or action means, you know, you've got to do something useful. You've got to build something people want. Uh, and that, you know, that's not a trivial step. It's actually the, the most important step. And so it's been really um, a privilege with the Data Futures Lab, which was set up to exactly tackle that, to fund people who are trying to build digital things with a different approach to data, one that's collective, one that's not extractive. And you say, you know, what we've seen is a pattern around say things like the gig economy and ride sharing in particular is a place where we've funded uh, a number of projects, you know, de delivery people, drivers and so on. There's a huge power asymmetry in how the relationship with the platforms work and it is manifested in, uh, in data. And so you see, people like the driver's seat cooperative or the driver's co-op in New York, trying to build either their own data collection mechanisms or use legal mechanisms um, and the worker info exchange is another example of this, use legal mechanisms uh, like subject access requests under GDPR to get the data under their control and then use that in a way that gives them more economic leverage, more legal leverage and, and so on. And so I, I think the, the promising avenues are where you see those real power asymmetries or felt harm or just felt shitty experience and people stepping up to, to build something and collect data in a way that counteracts that. So I think we wanna see more of that. And you know we can give a number of examples later in the conversation about people who are trying things in that way. I would say just as a last piece, what I think is often missing from our conversations and I, I would almost, you know, want to see as the fifth pillar or the, the appendix or the, the coda to the report is not just new infrastructure and new institutions, but also new or, or renewed economics. And we, we're just not going to see any of this change without that. And so that's a, a spectrum, you know, kind of is the, the, you know, you get to the end of the night over drinks and, you know, the, end, the problem is always capitalism. Um, but there's there's probably a pra more practical and nuanced version of that. And, and I would say many of the people who we work with uh, are trying to tackle that piece as well. And so whether that is on the one end of the spectrum of creating public goods and looking for what are the economics behind public goods at this point? Does, should the state support the growth of digital public goods? Should we should philanthropy support the growth of uh, digital public goods? Should people who use those public goods for commercial benefits support them? And so, you know, you've seen that question ar arise around Wikipedia for years where the public supports it, but should Google or others who extract value out of Wikipedia be paying back into it? So I think we need to tackle questions like that. Uh, and, you know, we're, we've worked with somebody in the Data Futures Lab or a group in the Data Futures Lab called PLACE, uh, which is a nonprofit organization mapping the urban world in ultra high resolution uh, in ways that are kind of controlled in a, in a manner that's controlled uh, in a perpetual legal trust in the public interest. And so that's a great example. There are people building something that fills a gap and has a different governance model. How do we fund that? And, you know, we've answered that question historically through things like public broadcasting and so on. We have to get into to that set of questions. And the other end of the spectrum, and I'll end here, is 
are there opportunities in, you know, whatever you want to call it, stakeholder capitalism, public benefit corporations, uh, different kinds of businesses um, to compete with the dominant business models uh, and, and still return value to founders and shareholders, uh, which is something we're exploring through, through something called Mozilla Ventures. Uh, and I can share examples from that uh, later on if that's helpful. But I, I do think we really need to look at the economics. If we, if we don't crack that, none of the other four things move at all. Yeah, I think what you've said has really resonated with lots of us on the call. Um, and you may have also just pinned the next three year project for the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is uh, how do we rethink the economics of digital public goods? Um, but thank you also, Mark, for reminding us that Mozilla has been an alternative voice in this space for 20 years now and working to build products that do counter those dominant narratives and concentration of power. I'm going to turn to Jenna now and ask the question again to you, Jenna, which is how do you see the current digital ecosystem and what is your vision for how it should change? Thanks. Um, I, you know, I really appreciated um, the report, the rethinking data report and all the inputs from the speakers so far. Um, I think I agree. It's so future thinking and, and offers some great provocations. But based on the work that um, we do at the Global Partnership, there is a point I kind of wanted to add. Um, to the consideration of power, and it's one that I think everyone knows and understands, but I think it bears repeating, which is that while indeed the large platform companies do have more power and the power dynamic between them and the public sector is unbalanced, there's also a real imbalance in the power dynamic between governments and individuals and groups. And that, um, you know, that when um, tech and data are in the hand of governments, just as we're all on the edge of our seat, I think she's cut out again, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry about that uh, to our attendees and I'm sorry, sorry to Jenna, hopefully she'll find her way back on. Um, Paul, I will turn to you. Obviously, you've lived and breathed this thinking for the last couple of years. And infrastructures. Oh, did we lose you? Oh, did you lose me? I'm sorry. I had I had started moving on, but please, you're back now. So you 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 were just about to say when tech and data are in the hands of governments. So I'll finish quickly to say that when tech and government uh, data are in the hands of governments, there's a lot of potential for harm as there is potential for innovation and uh, and good. And in many parts of the world where many of our hundreds of partners are, their chief concern is around what government may and may not be doing and what the checks and balances are or are not. Um, and the way in which governments may be getting in bed with some of these large corporations um, and uh, or uh, governments are subcontracting um, and not just to the large platform companies, but companies that runs biometric and digital ID, et cetera. So there are some very big issues with respect to accountabilities in the public sector um, that, uh, that I think are important not to lose sight of um, as, also, we are calling on the public sector to, um, you know, innovate and to exert much greater regulatory control, et cetera, um, on large corporations. So I'll just stop there. Thanks, Jenna. Sorry for the difficulties. Um, and it's you've touched on something that was really attention in the deliberations of the Rethinking Data Working Group and a great um, consideration, important consideration to remember. One of the things that we've been throwing around recently is the idea of kind of deprivatization of technology, but actually, you know, deprivatization in which direct direction and where does that create more risks rather than reduce them, I think is a really nutty um, problem to sort out. Paul, give us your thoughts on this big question about where we are and where we need to be. Thank you, Carly, and uh, thank you to uh, Ada Lovelace for the opportunity to work with this great group of experts from all around the world on this very important subject. <clears throat> I think it's important that we keep open a dream uh, uh, of a world in which uh, there is a primacy of democracy and the rule of law and where data uh, benefits society as a whole. 
And uh, so I think uh, this report is a first step in keeping open the stream and concretizing criticism. And I think we always need this criticism, but I would share uh, the view of um, the prior speakers that we have to move on beyond the criticism and develop the alternatives. And this requires political engagement on the one hand, but also it requires uh, engineering creativity and tenacity um, uh, in, in making it happen, in both building the technological artifacts uh, of the future, which uh, allow a more democratic uh, and more public benefit oriented data economy, but also um, the same type of innovation in the public sector, in the, or in, I, I wouldn't even call it public sector, I would say policy making. I think we need rules, we need enforcement, and I think it's very important, and for me, this is a step forward in this work, that we don't think in terms of either or. I think we need a, a, a progressive alliance of politics with progressive technology going hand in hand forward. And both elements are necessary. Of course, we can from time to time think about substitution relationships. But I think uh, neither, you know, the great technology uh, innovation of this or that alone will make it, nor for that matter, uh, you know, this or that piece of the law. So we need law which both constrains the power um, of those who are uh, right now uh, very dominant and who are able to extract uh, enormous profits and at the same time uh, make it difficult to enter uh, the market and to compete. And I think there in Europe uh, with the Digital Markets Act and generally with competition policy, I think we're making progress. It would be much better if uh, the United States itself would take these matters in hand. Um, uh, but, uh, but there we are. And at the same time, of cons after constraining power, uh, we need to enable. We need to enable new models. And that's where we get into the discussion of uh, the Digital Governance Act, the new types of uh, um, public good um, oriented intermediaries, and for that matter, also public infrastructure, um, whether publicly financed or whether in types of forms which are, uh, let's say, not stock market oriented in the, in the biggest uh, sense of the word. And this is basically about political orientation. Uh, I think there we really come back to the very basic world views and the same types of discussion of political orientation, which we have, for example, about public TV now uh, in many uh, member states of the uh, European Union and also in the UK. And I think we have to name uh, this um, uh, and be very clear about this politics. Um, I don't think that there are, let's say, uh, you know, the clear scientific solutions, you know, the best ethics, uh, the best technological model. I think in the end, uh, and there I would agree with those who say, you know, much comes down to the economics. And these are the classic um, uh, economic issues which have been at the center of political left-right uh, debates over the last century since the Second World War. And we have to acknowledge this. So I think we have to acknowledge that together with the new elements of data uh, and of the data economy and technology, there are some um, of the old issues of what is actually our worldview in terms of uh, a general outlook on politics. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy if uh, we continue to be able to engage the technical intelligentsia, the engineers who can build alternative technological software or, or, or hardware in this political debate, because um, I think we need a more power conscious and a more politics and democracy conscious and a more engaged um, uh, technological scene to get, get to where uh, we want to get to. Um, and I think, uh, at least for me, that was part of this exercise, um, you know, an interdisciplinary group where we have people who are more engaged in politics, talking with people who are more engaged in technology. And as much as those who are in policy and politics have to learn about technology, I would say there are many in the tech sector which have to learn and re-engage in democracy. And I hope that in this direction, we can continue working together across the globe, but also within democratic jurisdictions. Maybe let me stop with this thought I think it's good to have a global debate, but the damage 
which the internet does, or for that matter, the benefits which the internet bring to different jurisdictions really depends on the starting situation of the jurisdiction. For example, if you have a dictatorship which has blocked access to information and uh, um, basically hinders people to look what's happening out there on the internet, it's a great progress to have an internet freedom movement which opens up the internet for this jurisdiction. On the other hand, if you have a jurisdiction which is a well-functioning democracy, which public service with public service and a plurality of private press, and where the internet comes in um, unregulated, and where you have uh, you know the big players like Google and Facebook basically cashing out all the advertising money, and the press goes down the drain, and hate and violence is spread in this society as we see it in some member states of the European Union and in the United States. Um, there is probably not a net benefit of uh, the great uh, promise of freedom of the internet. So I think we have to recognize with our global debates and our global efforts that solutions and challenges will also depend on uh, the situations in which jurisdictions are. And that's where I think in the end, the recognition comes in that uh, let's say ideological uh, rules like, you know, we need the global unbroken internet they also have to be questions in this discourse, because if we think that to the end, it means we cannot have democratic rulemaking in one jurisdiction, which is different from another uh, rulemaking in another jurisdiction. So for me, it is very important to say, for example, we in Europe, we will and must go forward with our democratic rulemaking on um, the internet. And we cannot depend on whether uh, the United States likes it or not. And we can certainly not depend on, uh, you know, whether our EU laws eventually may be abused by the Chinese or the Russians or the Turks, because they abuse any law they can find as a precedent for some suppressing measures. So if we would follow that type of logic, which unfortunately often in the tech scene is, is still quite prevalent, we couldn't make any laws because mm. any of our laws are uh, eventually potentially abusable. Mm. So I think the learning exercise here is not only about technological models and data and, you know, these new elements. It is also relearning what engagement de in democracy really means and how democracy can function in the 21st century in the age of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Paul. And um, I mean, yeah, as always, kind of connecting us to the bigger picture, perhaps too big a picture, because I'm not sure if we can also solve democracy at the same time as we solve these other things. But uh, it's a really important challenge. I also like what you said, and this very much connected to the origins of the Rethinking Data Project about not always just talking about what we don't want, but starting to develop the vision for what we do want, and not just being led by what is technically possible, but having a democratic uh, process for articulating visions of societies and futures and then using technology to enable that. Some of what you said connected to the um, kind of challenge of finding a global solution to these issues and I think Jenna's remarks also um, touched a little on that and not there not being a kind of one size fits all uh, solution for this problem. I might come to you now, Jenna, and um, as I do, I'll just let the audience know that I think we're unlikely to get to open Q&A at the end of the event. So if you'd like to ask questions of the speakers, please do put them in the Q&A box and I will incorporate them as we go. But Jenna, the Global Partner for Sustainable Development Data ran a public consultation as part of the Val Data Values Project seeking to identify where there is consensus on what needs to change for data to describe to drive a more sustainable and equitable world. It would be great to hear more about that. And how does it tie to the challenges that you raised earlier on about um, the potential risks of empowering governments more with data? And I'm hoping we will hear from Jenna who's turned off her video to preserve her internet connection. But it seems not. We will add to our list of things to fix with technology, Wi-Fi on Kenyan beaches. Um, but oh, uh, I oh think there, I there she is. There you go. I'm very sorry. I'm uh, I'm in Kenya in a not very, I guess, well connected area, um, and which is why I have my video off. <laughs> and it was perfect right up until the moment when you came to me. So hopefully I'm coming through now. You are. And did you hear my question? Okay. 
Yeah, I think I think I did. So um, as Carly said, um, we um, conducted a, a quite broad consultation. And so um, one of the things that came out really clearly in that consultation was uh, about power, which is um, why it chimes and aligns so well with this report. And really, you know, what um, our partners around the world and their partners are really thinking about and grappling with is sort of who has power and who doesn't and how the act of measuring, collecting and using data by people, by machines, by companies can reinforce balance, power imbalances or create opportunities to shift those power dynamics. Um, so in September, when we launched the Data Values Manifesto, um, uh, we, we that manifesto articulates a five point sort of plan for a fair data future. So to the point about kind of building blocks and what are the key pieces that really came out of that consultation, that manifesto outlines a few key points. So they really include giving individuals and community more agency over their data vis-a-vis um, -vis those that have more power in the ecosystem. And as I said in my earlier comment, um, we heard a lot more in fact about concerns around the role that government may or may not be playing, um, not to the exclusion of these big powerful companies as well, um, but it's important to kind of see all sides of that, I think. Um, and uh, so the, the manifesto then calls for thinking about the ways in which people can be included in the design um, of data um, collection methods, in the produce, the production and analysis of data, and then in decisions around the use of that data. Another area was around public participation, and this is where there's also a lot of alignment um, with the report. Um, we began talking more and more about um, accountable data governance and talking about accountability. Um, in a way that is about the kind of checks and balances and oversight that exists and the interplay between more formal mechanisms of data governance, like legislation and regulation and informal mechanisms um, that enable public participation that may be embedded it within, um, within more formal mechanisms that may operate alongside or that may operate outside those mechanisms to create um, kind of watchdog um, setups and, and oversight mechanisms. And so we also like the Rethinking Data Report, we're looking at citizen juries and mechanisms like that. We saw examples from partners who had set up interesting sort of multi-stakeholder councils and committees that were embedded in uh, data sharing projects or um, decision making around data um, use in a particular sector that created avenues for communities or their representatives or civil society groups to weigh in in a way not as a one off, but in on a kind of recurrent basis um, and created much more accountability in that data governance process. Um, we are, the manifesto also touches on some elements that are not as um, present in the rethinking data piece about like what are the skills and abilities that ordinary people, community groups, organizations, governments need to kind of engage in this ecosystem um, to make this kind of participation and data governance a reality. And then lastly, some questions around funding and the economics. And I thought that point earlier on was really, really valid, um, looking at what are the economics um, of public-private data sharing, what really is going to drive um, uh, public goods. Um, uh, I think place is a very interesting example um, that was mentioned earlier um, because it, uh, it, not about like all open all the time, but about the kind of um, rules um, for entry and for sharing and who has access to what, when, and through what means um, and through different mediated processes and how to foster greater consultation and participation in accessing some of those public goods. Um, in a way that is still um, managed and protects the most marginalized and the most vulnerable people who often don't have voice, who are who um, um, don't have access um, uh, to to those decisions. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of alignment, I think, between the data values project and the institutions piece and the uh, public participation piece in the recommendations of the Rethinking Data Report. 
Thank you so much, Jenna. And I was going to ask you about um, the crossover bits, but it, they were very evident actually on the face of your description, including on public participation. So I really recommend uh, audience members follow up and read that um, that manifesto because it sounds incredibly relevant to this work. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Sushant. And Sushant, I wanted to ask you a bit about the future of data challenge, which is um, something that the Emilia network is running at the moment. And uh, the objective of that challenge is to imagine alternative data realities, find a healthy relationship with data and unlock value for everyone. I wonder if you could talk about um, in a confidential manner, of course, at some of the trends you're seeing emerging from that challenge or any kind of interesting ideas, are there particular themes that you're you're finding from applicants that they are leaning towards? What would you say is the kind of most prominent types of approaches that uh, are being suggested? And if I may tie in a question from Q&A as well, we've had somebody ask about the idea of companies paying individuals for data uh, in the sense that it would, I suppose, change what you talked about in terms of misaligned incentives. Um, uh, moving from what are essentially kind of publicly available services to something that companies actually have to pay for and therefore potentially value more. I wonder if that's the type of intervention you would see as being consistent with the future of data challenge or your vision of a more equitable ecosystem. Great questions. And uh, just to quickly touch upon two points, one which Mark made and other that Paul uh, also spoke about. Um, and, and these were, uh, uh, these were one, Mark spoke about specific examples and um, he also mentioned uh, driver's seat. And we think making data work for people and communities and planet um, instead of working against them manifests really well in the case of uh, the app-based worker, the gig economy, and therefore the work that the driver's seat cooperative, trying to become a data cooperative, um, is, is the sort of um, sort of practice or is the sort of example real world solutions that we would want to test for sure. And the second bit that uh, Paul spoke about, which was around uh, a progressive alliance, and Jenna also alluded to it. Um, this is again, uh, something very close to the kind of work that we want to do and we, we want, would want to see more of is building coalitions and building coalitions across the spectrum in terms of how we can bring in more capacity, resources, and funding to the space. And there, therefore, the actors were trying to advance that, bring, bring together those uh, coalitions, which, can, which will move these discussions forward. Um, our, we're, we're sort of the, uh, if I may, ideal uh, applicants as well to, to uh, the future of data challenge. So solutions and coalitions were, were uh, something top of our mind. Um, in terms of why we went out and said, you know, we, we should do an open call and look at what's out there, is starting with a, a generative positive vision of painting the picture of what future of data challenge could look like. We wanted it to be as broad based and diverse. Carly, you want to come in? Okay, you had your hand raised. So um, that's fine. So we wanted it to be as broad based in terms of the geographic coverage, in terms of types of solutions, whether it's regulatory technology, business model uh, related, and also the type of people that we hear from. And that's why we went the route of uh, an open call. Um, I think in, 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 in to, to a large extent, there are some overlaps and similarities with the Data Futures Lab that Mark uh, and Mozilla are leading. Um, and at least on the solution side, at least on the specific examples of what, what entrepreneurs and risk takers are trying out, uh, we, we would want to, to support and uh, move forward, at least uh, provide early stage support to some of those uh, examples. What we are seeing, and this, is, this was uh, intended um, as well, um, that there's been, uh, in, in terms of what we have seen, there is a landscape that exists. There, there is a set of uh, stakeholders that exist across the globe. So there's interest from the US and Europe for sure, but we are seeing applications and interest from a very broad variety of uh, geographies. That's one. Second, we wanted to see uh, you know, diversity of solutions. And we've seen 
um, we have seen examples of applications that are about regulatory interventions. What can be that point solution that can enable a specific activity? Uh, we've seen uh, uh, examples of uh, you know advocacy for public interest minded uh, intermediaries. How can we elevate that uh, and, and sort of create a political case or develop a political case for that? Uh, there are examples of, without giving much away, global networks of community-driven approaches, which is very much towards the point on participation. Uh, uh, so there's a top-down regulatory approach, but what about you know, uh, the democratic participatory approach coming from people uh, themselves? The, the uh, couple that I'm really interested and excited about are technology infrastructure, which are, which are being uh, developed to create, to be created more like public interest infrastructure to enable responsible data sharing. So at scale, some of these can be alternatives. Some of these can be showcased as alternatives to, um, to the existing, say, the incentive models, the existing uh, revenue models. And, and these, are, these are the ones that we are very, very um, uh, sort of excited about. Overall, um, I think, one of the goals for us was also to uh, get that message out that we want to rethink uh, what data is, how we think about the future and create um, a, a fairer uh, data future, which is built on inclusion and empowerment as the higher ideals, but begin seeing those solutions that can lead to change on ground. That's great. And it's really interesting. And one of the questions I was going to ask you, but you answered was, do you, do you see a leaning towards kind of policy interventions, regulatory, community-based or technology? And it's great to see that there is a mix of all because that, I mean, certainly reflects our findings in the report that you need infrastructural changes, governance changes and community-based changes. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we're quite short on time, so I have to move on. And I'm going to ask Mark to speak a bit more about the Data Values Project and it obviously, sorry, sorry, the Data Futures Lab, apologies. And it obviously links to what Sushant was just saying. And then I'll come to Paul for final remarks at the end. Sorry, Mark, and just tell us a bit more about that, that initiative and, and how it yeah. relates to, to this thinking. And I'll, I'll be brief so we can get to, to Paul. Um, but I, you know, I think the key piece is the one that you and Sushan just touched on is that there's no one set of interventions that shifts the field. I mean, that, that's the ultimate, how you want this change to happen is you have to be pushing on the regulatory front and then building things and building economic, building technology, building economics that play into that and then working with communities and, and people. Um, I would say, you know, the Data Futures Lab, uh, which basically provides funding as well as convening and kind of shared field learning for people trying to build alternative, build things that are useful to people using alternative data structures and collective data structures really is in the solutions part of it or the kind of infrastructure part of it. We're not, Data Future Lab is, is not in the policy part of it or, um, or directly doing end user products. Um, and, and in that, uh, and you know, some of the things are that, that we've funded and supported are the kinds of things I talked about before, the different drivers, cooperatives, place. Um, we're about to, to launch a cohort that is focused on people doing data donations. And I, I guess the big, learning from that is, I mean, it's kind of boring, um, is it's hard and it needs money to take these ideas and actually put them in, in place. Um, I mean, there, everything we've supported um, has a real chance to drive things in terms of taking the idea of say collective data governance just as one piece uh, and, and putting it into action. But doing that in a way that you actually build it and people use it and you can sustain it, um, that, that's the hard work of taking these ideas and, and kind of putting them into action. And I would say to link it back to the report a little bit, some of these things are, are really trying to crack some of the things we've talked about as the big theoretical nuts like interoperability. So one of the first things we funded was Consumer Reports effort to leverage CCPA. So you already have legislation in, in place in South California to give people um, a way to sort of express their data preferences across platforms. So they wanted to build sort of an, an, um, an interoperable mechanism for, for doing that. The, the difficulty of finding consumer demand, building the technology that can work, 
having the the kind of tech companies or providers that are going to like test bid bed the interoperability is a tremendous like practical political and economic challenge and and so I think that the main thing that that we've learned uh, through the Data Futures Lab is to find those people and to try to stay in the game with them and to hopefully bring more people, which I mean, really excited the work that Midyar is doing to the table to, to back this. Cause I mean, we, we're in a stage moving from the theoretical to the practical that is probably a few decades long and investing in those kind of projects in a sustained way so that the policy visions we have, the political visions we have, the things the progressive alliance wants actually get built uh, is a really critical thing and is a tiny, tiny, tiny set of players at the table trying to do that. So I, I think, you know, more patience and more money trying out real things um, is is the real thing that's needed. I and mean, that's, that's the simple, boring learning of the Data Futures Lab. It's such an important point, and it obviously relates to your earlier one about the economics, but it's certainly one of our intentions was to think about how you draw more funding into the space to really rethink these big infrastructural issues. Um, Paul, we are at the end of our hour, but I wonder if there's anything final you'd like to say about um, uh, the kind of radical vision here, which is essentially we have to restructure institutions and the distribution of power in order to, to get the technological ecosystem we want. Are there any kind of final remarks you'd leave participants with? You're on mute still, I'm afraid. Sorry, um, I think we have to watch now very critically uh, how <clears throat> the new laws uh, in the European Union, like the Digital Market Act, Digital Service Act, uh, Data Governance Act, Data Act, AI regulation, and so on, and also GDPR, are being uh, implemented, and whether they really make a difference, whether they have the grip and open up uh, this avenue to, uh, let's say, a more public interest-oriented future or not. And um, I think um, we also have to be careful not to be naive. Um, I, I must say, I, I very much agree with what previous speakers said. You know, these issues are complicated. There are not very many people who understand or who want to engage in this. So um, um, I would say um, this um, managing the, uh, the way towards a different future in the data economy is actually, um, and there I would say, Carly, you know, if you say, we, let's see whether we can solve the problem of democracy, but let's, you know, we'll have to see. I think it is very closely linked to the challenge of democracy, because this is about the question, how can democratic process apply to very complex uh, technical, either lawmaking, implementation of the law, or building of new uh, systems, whether software, hardware, and so on. And so I think we have to recognize that, um, you know, I'm sorry to be a little bit blunt and provocative here, um, uh, you know, uh, a naive calling for public participation everywhere and this and that, it, it will not solve it because we need centers of expertise. We also need centers of counterpower who are empowered by law and uh, to make the laws, uh, we need some people who, you know, are ready to dig into the detail and, and go the hard way. Um, and uh, we need to find ways of how they get support. And um, while I'm a great friend of reinventing institutions, at the same time, I think we also have to work on empowering our institutions of democracy, like political parties and uh, parliaments, to be able to still master these complexities and come to the right solutions. And I think it is, will be a very important work to accompany critically what has been produced in legislation now and to see whether it works. You know, for example, uh, the issue of um, uh, interoperability, op uh, interoperability obligations, maybe we didn't go far enough. And, uh, you know, if the law doesn't oblige interoperability, uh, you know, civil society and technology alone will not bring it about. Yeah. So um, I think uh, while uh, we need to be ready to uh, think anew, part of the thinking anew means also 
a new way of empowering existing democratic institutions to do the job which the future requires. Mm. So um, I think therefore that the challenge of the data economy and the challenge of new technology is very deeply linked to the fate of democracy. I would go as far as saying that some of the populist movements today have to do something with the technological communication environment, the data-driven bubbles uh, of opinions and so on, which we live in today. They have to do something with the fact that the mobile phone is very small and the screen of the mobile phone is so small that it's just great for populist slogans, but not big enough to have a, a, a differentiated discourse in writing. So I think it is important that we continue thinking these tech questions as essential questions of organization, including technological organization of democracy in the future. And I would say we must continue linking these issues and not trying to delink them and to create, uh, let's say, artificial um, uh, differentiations. In the end, the well, way the technology is structured will determine how democracy functions in the future. Yeah. So, sorry to cut you off, but speaking of restrictive technological means, we are restricted by time and we're at the end of our uh, webinar. But um, as always, thank you for, for that um, rousing call to action. Um, I've heard some common themes today, which are about patience, more money, uh, urgency, uh, radical ideas, um, counter power and reforming democratic institutions. So a lot to chew on uh, as we leave. I hope if you take away anything, um, uh, it will be, well, I hope if anything comes of this, it will be our, in 10 years time, we'll get together and all remember that, um, that one webinar where we talked about our visions for the future and we can celebrate how many of them have come to fruition. Um, so see you in 10 years time. And in the meantime, please continue to follow the work of the Ada Lovelace Institute, read our report, engage with us. Uh, we've recently published a great blog series um, uh, on collective action, which we'd also welcome you to engage with. And I will let you go seeing as we're over time. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thanks Carly and Valentina. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank Thanks, you. Mark. Thanks Paul. Thanks Jenna. Thank you.